Hello and welcome back or welcome to the channel. I'm Loudguns and today we're going to be taking a look at the new Overdrive initiative that kicks off a few weeks of new missions, pitting players working on behalf of the civilian defence force against Xeno Threat. If this sounds good to you, then grab a cup of tea while I roll the updated widescreen intro, then let's get into it. So let's start out with exactly what the Overdrive initiative is. Essentially this is the start of a series of missions, so as of yesterday we've got the first phase, Intel Raid. But over the next coming weeks we'll see more varied missions coming out, involving different types of gameplay, but mostly centred around combat with the Xeno Threat faction. All of these will build up to a run of the reworked Xeno Threat fleet battle, which I for one am hugely looking forward to. XT when it works is probably my favourite dynamic event since it brings in different elements of combat and logistics that rewards folks working together. Of course, there's an opportunity here for a new ship drop, and with the launch of the Overdrive initiative we've got the new Anvil Hornet F7C Mark II on sale. This updated version of the Hornet has more firepower and a sleeker updated profile that I personally really like. You know, recently I've been liking the original Hornet and to my mind this is a cool upgrade. I've got no real comments on the hard currency pricing. Everyone who completes the full Overdrive initiative chain, all the different phases that are released over the coming weeks, will get a free CCU upgrade token to go from the F7C Mark II to the full military spec F7A Mark II. For the avoidance of doubt though, that does mean you would need to buy the F7C Mark II for cold hard cash to apply it. I always like to sound the reminder whenever I get an opportunity to that you don't need to buy anything more than a starter pack to enjoy Star Citizen and to get involved with stuff like these missions. After a patch or two you'll find pretty much everything enters the in-game ship shops. If you do want to get into the game then there is a pretty decent deal on at the moment for an Avenger Titan which is just that bit better than a Mustang or an Aurora which are usually the cheapest options. Just be sure to use a referral code for some extra credits when you create an account, mine is the one up on screen right now, but if you've got any mates who play already please just use theirs. I think the most important thing is these missions, is the new gameplay that we're going to get, um, and I think that's the thing to focus on above the ship sales. So over the next few weeks as more of the missions get released I'm going to look to update this mini series and take a look at each of them as they come up, but today we've got Intel Raid which is the first one. So over at Frontier, I've run through this a couple of times so far in the last couple of days, although I know at least one of my org mates has got through it four times as he tries to get it on multiple accounts. And it is worth noting that you will probably need a group to do this one effectively. As we'll see shortly, the mission does lend itself to a bit of teamwork. So if you need some help, please do feel free to pop into our Discord, the link's just down in the video description down below. You'll find the mission in the main general tab of your Moby Glasses contract manager, and it'll pop up in the priority category. Note that this could send you to any of the different planetary systems. The mission uses existing bunkers, so you can get them on Microtech and Hurston, and then you can get them on any of Stanton's moons. To fully complete the phase, you will need to complete 5 missions total, so keep in mind that you'll probably want a ship that can eat up big distances. In terms of prep, You'll want to pack your FPS gear, armour, weapons, ammunition, and unlike in the normal bunkers where you tend to get a bit more variety of enemy weapons, for the most part the Xeno Threat bad guys will be packing Custodian and P8 SMGs. So if you are relying on scavenged ammo, you might want to take one of those with you. If you're going with something else, keep in mind that these missions will burn through ammo particularly if you're chaining them together, so just make sure you take plenty of spare, maybe putting some into your armour, some into your backpack and some into your ship. Before you begin, you might also want to swing by Grim Hex or New Babbage to buy some Tiger Claw hacking cards, since they'll most likely be needed during the mission. There is a fairly good chance that you'll find them at the bunkers, but you know, if you don't bring one, that's the point that you're not going to find them. 
The bunkers themselves are going to be hostile, and as many as four turrets will be pew pewing you when you get into range. So you've got a couple of options here. The main one that we used was to approach in a heavier turreted ship like a Carrick or a Redeemer, and tank the turrets while our own gunners took them out. However, if you don't maybe have this level of firepower, or you just want to take a more subtle approach, then you can always pack a ground vehicle like a cyclone into your ship, land a couple of kilometres away, taking advantage of terrain where you can to land closer and get out of line of sight of those turrets, and then drive to the bunker since the turrets will only target air vehicles. Take the elevator down and clear out the targets. The Xenothreat bad guys wear some distinctive red armour sets, and as cool as some of it looks, maybe loot it and save it for later. I probably wouldn't recommend wearing the same if you're running with friends, since you might find yourself the subject of friendly fire. Find your way to the server room, where towards the back you'll find a terminal, where you can insert your hacking card to run a hacking process. You'll need to click continue whenever it gets frozen, while keeping an eye out for any new bad guys spawning from the elevators. As a side note, you may be able to find an access key, either in a loot box or in the armour or clothing of one of the bad guys. We found one on one of the civilian helpers they have with them, and this could be inserted to bypass the need to hack the system at all. Also worth noting though, since we found this one after we'd already hacked the console, that we tried it on our next mission and it didn't work. So once the hack has run or you've used the access card, you can click on accept to proceed. So now you're going to be uploading data, and we'll need to keep the firewalls from going up for the duration. So look at these terminals along the server room and find the one which says a number that's not zero. This is the one that you're currently uploading through. Periodically, cooling for one of the servers will shut down and you'll need to enter a code to restart it. We think, based on our limited testing, that the overheat is most likely to occur on the server that's transferring data. But it definitely can happen on any of them, so you sort of need to keep an eye out for any orange blinking lights, and you can also listen for the audio cues. Throughout the bunker you'll find screens that show generic information most of the time. But when these overheats happen, one of the screens will have an overlay that provides you with a four digit code. You'll also notice that down below there's a line that states cooling system disabled for server and then a code beginning with an S and three digits. This corresponds to a code your mate will be able to see in the server room, with each of the terminals having an identifier for the specific server. Mission 1 is fairly kind to you, and will point you in the direction of the right wall panel with a marker, and will typically only allow one server to overheat at a time. But as you go further up the chain, there's more chance that more than one server could overheat simultaneously. These server identifiers then become really useful for telling you which is the right one to enter. After mission 1 of 5, you'll notice that the marker's also gone, and it'll be up to you and your team to look around different wall screens to find the one with the message. In all of this, you are up against a timer, so here's where it really pays to be working as part of a group, with someone in the server room monitoring the terminals there and tapping in the codes that are relayed to them by other members of the team. You know, we split up so that we could each had a section to cover across the bunker's two decks, and this all just made it much, much easier. As did having extra people to protect from new enemies spawning in when you're reading out or tapping in the numbers. I don't honestly know what happens if you fail to get the code in in time, since due to the numbers we had, we didn't miss any in all of our test missions. I'd imagine there's some element of punishment, either in terms of the transfer and maybe even mission failure. You can monitor the transfer progress overall at the console that you first hacked in the server room. On missions 1 and 2 of the chain, you'll need to complete 2 uploads, 3 and 4 you'll need to do 4 uploads, and mission 5 you'll need to complete 6. For reference, each upload seems to take around 5 minutes, so you're looking at roughly 10, 20 and 30 minutes once you get the upload section started. Once you complete the mission, you'll be able to head back to your ship and accept the next one that pops. Again this might involve travelling to a different planetary system the other side of Stanton, so it does really pay if you're chaining these together to bring a ship with decent amounts of fuel and an upgraded jump drive like an XL1 or a TS2, just to speed things up a bit. We also did run into some bugs, you know, it's Star Citizen at the end of the day. So we did find one of the best ways to avoid things getting mixed up was to have one person in the group who was accepting the missions on behalf of all of us, rather than mixing up who was accepting and sharing the mission. 
So we ran the whole chain earlier today, and with a group of five to six of us, it took around three hours total. But that was with a server crash and a ship switch, which involved a pretty long claim time. So I think streamlined and with the server god smiling on you, you could probably get this down to closer to two hours. And you could always get a bit lucky with where your next mission spawns, it's all down to the travel time really. As a final little bonus, I would say keep an eye out for the heavy armoured bad guys who show up in the fifth mission. Because this set, in particular this helmet, is just really cool and it's definitely worth bagging yourself a set of if you can. I know that we've got some loot goblins over at FRCN, so we'll probably be back to backing this until everyone has a set, or you know, multiple sets. So I hope this was an interesting run through and maybe helps a few folks who aren't quite sure how this works. It's honestly really fun and I particularly love this type of mission design that rewards the teamwork. I'm really looking forward to seeing what else comes up in the Overdrive initiative and like I said I'll be trying to make small video guides like this covering each of them as they come out. So if you think it would be helpful then please do hit subscribe to the channel so you can keep up with those over the next few weeks. And I'm also massively hyped for the culmination of this with the reworked Xenothreat Dynamic event when it drops alongside Invictus launch week. This is honestly just so much fun, particularly if you get involved with a big group or working together to complete it. So as I said before at the start of the video, please don't hesitate to pop into the FRCN Discord and say hi. Yeah, we do have an org, but there's no pressure to join. We put loads of our events on for all of the community, just to give people that taste of large-scale multiplayer action. With all that said, thank you very much for watching all the way to the end, and I look forward to seeing you next time.